So yep. Uh, so welcome back again to uh, for everybody who's joined newly to this session of uh, Bootcamp Rural Service Bootcamp 2.0, uh, fifth webinar in our series of this edition. Uh, today's topic is on surgery with an emphasis on minor OT procedures and diagnosing common surgical conditions. I'm sure in your rural service um, centers, you might be coming across uh, a lot of surgical cases. Uh, and I'm sure this would help you in diagnosing those simple surgical issues, knowing when to refer more complex issues and what you could perform if you have a minor OT uh, with your rural service centers. So now we will introduce our speakers for today. So today we have two very experienced speakers. So the teaching session will be taken by um, uh, Nathaniel. So we all know Nathaniel, he's from Batch of 2015. Um, he he, is, he served two years of his rural service in St. Teresa's Mission Hospital, Tandla in Madhya Pradesh. He has worked in a &E in St. John's for six months. And now he is working as a junior clinical teaching fellow in vascular surgery in Royal Free Hospital. Um, he's also involved in teaching program for medical students in UCLH. And he also has a keen uh, interest in surgery, particularly in hepatobiliary. And he's also showing interest in abdominal trauma surgery as well. So let's welcome Nathaniel. Also, we will welcome the expert for today. The moderator for today is uh, Dr. Syed Saad. Dr. Syed Saad is a general and laparoscopic surgeon from Bangalore. Uh, he did his UG at Bangalore Medical College and Research Institute. He did his PG at MVJ Medical College and Research Hospital. He's currently working as an assistant professor at St. John's Hospital. And uh, he has a keen interest in minimally invasive trauma surgery and complex hernia conditions. He's an award winner for paper presentation at national level conferences like ASICON and poster presentation at state level conferences. Actively involved as a member of the curriculum committee uh, undergraduate level and has initiated the cadaver dissection program for postgraduates at St. John's. Uh, I warmly welcome Dr. Saad and Dr. Nathaniel to this session. Um, so let's just uh, give a short introduction to how the uh, structure of the session is going to be. So we will have a 20 minutes teaching session where um, Nathaniel will be presenting and Dr. Saad can give some expert input. Um, uh, while when du during the session, what you can do is you can note down your uh, queries and doubts or you can put it up in the chat or in the group uh, we have for uh, discussions. And we'll keep the interruptions to a minimum so that we can finish the teaching session. And then we can have a short break. Uh, and we, I've already uh, uploaded the feedback form to both the groups and the chat. So you can fill out the feedback forms. You can put your queries in your chat. And we can have a session uh, with both of them where they'll be able to answer your questions. Uh, I'll Now I'll uh, hand over to Nathaniel to start the session. Nathaniel, you can uh, tell yeah. me you need to change the slides. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. First of all, hello, everyone. Um, it's, I'm sure, a good Sunday evening. <laughs> Not very happy to be on a it's... class up to her. Everyone wants to enjoy their Sundays, but yeah. So uh, it's going to be a lot of simple uh, surgical uh, conditions, common surgical conditions. I will try to see if we can squeeze in time for like a video for for doing like a excision of serviceous cyst. I've got like a video there, but I'll see how we can work playing that out. But mostly we'll go through some a few cases. So I would like some more interaction. I don't want to pick out names. So if you people think, because the, the cases will have a lot of questions in between, which I would like if people could answer. I don't want to pick out names. You can just feel free to answer. All right. OK, let's go to the next slide, please, Daniel. Yeah, so the objectives of today's class is for diagnosing uh, and managing common surgical conditions at a primary level. And mostly in your, I know you've been most of y'all because most of these topics that I've arranged is based on a questionnaire that I, I had asked you guys before. And these were the things that most of y'all, I think only seven or eight of y'all 
have given me a feedback out of i don't know 20 people or so so this is the feedback that i got and i've uh, made my slides around that so diagnosing common medical uh, surgical conditions in the primary care level and what you can do at a primary care level with respect to dealing with acute abdomen uh, also looking at wounds looking at different types of what would you what, how would you deal with diabetic foot wounds that are non healing and when do you need to refer a patient when he's septic, all of that? What are the criteria for that? Then we look at like minor surgical procedures like doing excisions, um, incision and drainage, simple things like suturing. Some, some, there are very few, like there are a lot of things that you've already probably done in internship, but then you just have a lot of doubts when you're doing it alone because that time and in internship, you can always go up to a PG and someone and ask them, you know, how, when do we remove these sutures? what time, how many days, all of those kind of things. Very silly things, but then they are quite important. So we will go through those. And then, yeah, different suturing techniques, where and where and when, how we can use these, what types of sutures we need to use, all of that. Okay, next slide. So this is the case. Uh, would someone like to read it out, please? Anyone? Guys, come on, don't be so shy. We're not eating you up. Please, and someone read out the case, please. Daniel, do they do they respond or they don't? Yeah, yeah they can <laughs> open the yeah, and we you know it's we are all uh, Johnites, so you know. Yeah, guys, come on, man, we are Johnites. There's nothing big. Can someone please read up the slide? Read out the case. I'm sure Nathaniel wouldn't be asking you too many questions because you read the slides. So somebody... Yeah, yeah. Okay, then if I read the slide, then the question goes to you. <laughs> okay, anyone? Or oh, you don't want me to pick out names because I don't want to do that. That's just mean. Okay, is no one reading? Uh, Daniel, can you just pick someone up for me, please? Come on, you're giving me the tough choice. <laughs> I can see just two names right now. Is there like more people or? Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, there are around 18 or something, 17 people on that. Anybody on the, can, on, if you can. Can so someone we, please read this? Slide. We're not going to ask you any questions, just that we. Yeah, it's, it's the, just that I want some interaction. Or like an icebreaker where you guys can, uh, you know, when you're interacting more, I'm sure they're teaching, uh, whoever is teaching will also be more comfortable. Okay, I, I don't want just, to just just okay let's just just let it be it's fine all right okay so there's a 32 year old female with uh, complaints of a right lower abdominal pain colicky intermittent pain since the last four to five hours which associated with some vomit with vomiting with multiple episodes which are non-bilious and no blood in the vomitus anyone wants to tell what additional history they would like to ask Uh, hi. Uh, uh, you could yeah. probably ask if uh, it if it was earlier in another place and it moved there. Okay, that's good. Like a migratory pain. Okay, what else? Uh, that's all I could think of. Okay, so you can also ask like so when you have these symptoms, like I said, abdominal symptoms, you need to rule out like most of the things around that area. So like you would think of in a woman, uh, what would you think of if you have right lower abdomen pain, what 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 would you think of? What are the, what are the possible uh, conditions that present with an acute lower abdomen pain in a right? So that's where your DDs come. And based on your DDs, you will ask, try to ask these questions. So one thing is important to ask is your menstrual history. So you need to ask whether when she's had a period, how long back, all of that. Then you should ask even urinary symptoms because for all you know, this kind of pain could also be just a UTI or something like that. So you need to ask if it's dysuria. You need to ask about, she said, I said vomiting. You need to ask about constipation, obstipation. So all these kind of things. Again, uh, so your DD is in this. What do you think of the DDs? Rishikesh, right? Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what, what what would be your DDs in this case? Like right lower abdomen pain, acutely presenting with vomiting. What do you think of the DDs? Uh, acute appendicitis. Very good. Then? 
then uh, uh, endometriosis. If okay, but endometriosis, will, yeah, it can present, but it will have a lot of what do you say? She will have a lot of this. Uh, it will be repetitive on and off, multiple p. Uh, like sometimes at the same time of the month, every month along the same days, things like that. So those that history again, you can ask. Yeah, anything else? Uh, Acute right lower abdomen pain. Uh, okay, no problem. Don't break your head. Next, next, uh, next slide, Daniel. So yeah, so again, like I said, no history of constipation, obstipation, no history of fever. Very important. There was no history. She also complained of increased frequency of micturation. So again, there's a there was a history of outside food consumption two days ago, and she was also uh, she's a P two L two previous LSCS, but a period of ten days ago. So what these will be your DDs: ectopic pregnancy, ureteric colic, acute appendicitis, ovarian torsion. Now, how would you uh, rule out all these things? Do you think it's ectopic pregnancy in this case? Rishikesh, you can answer. Sorry, um, I'm just because you're the only one talking here. So, <laughs> yeah. What's against what's against ectopic pregnancy in this case? Uh, I'm not sure. No. So she's had a period ten days ago. So that that's again one of the things that she okay. But again, you need to rule out whether she, when her last period, last to last menstrual period was, because these ten days ago could just be spotting and an early sign of ectopic pregnancy. Second thing is, uh, again, this could be very likely ureteric colic because she's also having UTI-like symptoms. Um, this could still be appendicitis, uh, but what do you think is uh, not in favor of appendicitis? <laughs> fever. Yeah, fever is, is quite an important uh, symptom. When it, but it can be, again, appendicitis sometimes may not have fever also. Ovarian torsion, again, is very important to see if the patient, if she had like a previous history of PCOS, any large size ovaries, because those can generally go into uh, torsion. Next slide, Daniel, please. So this was her on examination. So his vitally uh, blood pressure is 170, 90. She was a little anxious because of the pain. So her blood pressure was up. Her, her pulse rate was normal. As saturation was normal. Temperature was normal. On examination, her abdomen was soft. Tenderness in the right iliac fossa. There was no rebound tenderness, no flank pain. Uh, but she had flank tenderness and her bowel sounds were present. So now, Rishikesh, what do you think is the diagnosis? Ah, okay. So, so now you're looking at it, it looks more of like, because there's flank tenderness, which is a sign of, again, hydroureteronephrosis. Oh, you can go to the next slide, Daniel. It's okay. So, yeah. So, the possible diagnosis in this would be a right ureteric colic because she's having flank pain. She's got urinary tract symptom. She's got uh, pain, uh, which and also vomiting as well. And all of this would suggest like a lower um, ureteric uh, stone causing um, backflow in the kidney and uh, causing basically swelling up of the kidney and hydroureteronephrosis. So that's why she's having the flank tenderness, the renal angle tenderness. Uh, and then when we probed further and asked her if she's had similar complaints, she said she's had previous complaints of loin to groin pain, and um, which has been radiating from the loin to groin previously as well. So this could be that she's had previous episodes of ureteric colic. So how would you investigate this patient? What are the things you would like to do next? Guys, Rishikesh? if you don't want to speak up, you can actually put it in the chats. If uh, uh, we can have a read through mm -hmm. of the answers you can give in the chats. Does anyone want to speak? I think they are very scared of us, sir. <laughs> <laughs> we look very scary. Actually. Okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah. I'll just comment on a few things before we go ahead. Uh, so far, good. Uh, the case was well settled. 
uh, with regards to its presentation. But one thing you guys need to note is one in the right lower quadrant, but torn bill is vomiting. Okay, so there is a good clinical point to note because it might not just be a right lower quadrant organ related issue, right? It can always be something to do with a gastric, you know, Valentino type something going down because non bill is vomiting again, or it could be like uh, in this case, uh, renal related. So, you know, the kidney has the same splanctic sympathetic supply as your uh, rest of your GIT. That can again cause non bilious vomiting. So, these are, the, these are the few things that you can keep in mind. And obviously, LMP related as spotting and everything as Nathaniel has covered. So, uh, if you go to the first slide, if that's okay with you, I'll just do, do a brief run through before you go to investigations. Yeah. yeah okay. Daniel? Yeah. Yeah, I'll go to slide. Uh, yeah. No, because if it was interactive, if someone would have spoken up, it would have been nice, but it's okay. We'll try to take it from here. Okay. So colicky type of intermittent type of pain. Okay. A uh, rare for an appendix to do that. Okay. An appendix is an inflammatory related. It's not obstruction related. Okay. Uh, the other thing is, as I've already mentioned, non-bilious and why blood in vomit? So why was this question asked? Uh, or why was that history taken up as a primary important history to be noted? Anyone know? Again, it's gastric related. Okay, we're trying to roll out any upper GI related issues, which is trickling down, causing pain in the right lower quadrants or low quadrants per se. Okay, which can give us a it kind of gives you a brief idea on what to investigate and how to proceed with your case. Okay, uh, next slide, please, Daniel. Okay, so uh, this is small. Uh, sometimes what happens is the patient comes and it just overloads you with a lot of information. In this case, history of outside food consumption is that kind of overloaded information. So yeah, you need to be able to pass through. Yeah, that's so exactly that's, why I put it there. Yeah, that's... exactly. So, uh, like I said, this is actually a good case for you guys to learn from because you learn to pass through the information that's actually required for you and which is not. Uh, once you come to investigation, I'll again say uh, or explain rather why increased frequency of maturation becomes important here. Right? It can still be uretric, need not be just bladder. A uh, few things related to that. Uh, such as lower, you know, uh, if you have vesico uretic junction related uh, calculi and block, that usually presents a bladder uh, irritability and symptoms associated with it. So it's like everything the patient tells you. You need to know what to take, what to pass through, what to filter out, and then leave out. So in this case, patient comes with a low quadrant pain, but vomiting is non bilious, right? Something, something's happening above the pylorus, or could be. Another thing to note is urinary frequency is increased. And with the recent consumption of food outside, you, you're kind of stuck between multiple areas. So coming to an important or at least getting two provisional diagnoses at this point would be good enough for you. Getting Because getting stuck with one provisional diagnosis, you might miss out on something else, especially in a primary health center. right? You don't get a second chance because from there, the patient directly goes either to a higher center or something and you miss out. Okay, okay, fine. We can, if we can continue with the this thing next slide. Okay, here as well, this tenderness in the RIF as well as flank tenderness. So, there's a few things to note here. By flank tenderness, we're also including something called as a renal angle. Okay, so this tenderness in the RIF, why can there be flank tenderness? Again, you're stuck with two possibilities. Could it still be a retrocycle appendix or is it something kidney related? So, you're starting to go more towards something else, right? You already have urinary symptoms. You have vomiting. You don't have fever, like Nathaniel said, and fever need not be a criteria. We'll come to Alvarado's later. So the tenderness in the RF as well as flank tenderness. So again, you're stuck between the appendix and kidney now. So you're stuck with two organs that you've watered down your thinking to two organs. Next slide. Uh, next slide was the provisional that Nathaniel came up with. I'll give it back to Nathaniel. He can go with investigations and then we'll see why this way of thinking is, becomes important later on. Yeah, Nathaniel, up to you. Back yeah, to you. so yes. we, so it, like he said, the provisional was right uretric colic. Uh, I didn't think of uh, appendicitis at that point of time because, I, again, it, it is a possibility, but I, I went ahead with right uretric colic. So because of that, we went ahead and... Uh, uh, so and the similar past history that she spoke about, we went ahead and did. Uh, so the investigations we did next slide, Daniel. It was an ultrasound versus doing a CTKB. That was that was a big question mark there because again a lot of stones can't be seen and on an ultrasound. 
uh, and CTKUB is supposed to be the diagnosis. I mean, the investigation, non-contrast CTKUB is supposed to be the investigation of choice. But then again, in a resource limited setting, like uh, in probably a tribal area like that, we probably CT would be like two hours away. Uh, so X-ray KUB was another uh, diagnosis, I mean, another investigation tool that we use. Doing a blood uh, serum creat blood urea looking at the urine routine microscopy, urine cultures, CBC. And again, the treatment is again, since uh, doing all of this would be give us a fairly good idea. USG, basically, we would want to look at if there's any backstream uh, hydroureteronephrosis, any thinning of the cortex, anything that uh, probably would suggest um, uh, like basically backflow because of a downstream block, because of a stone. Sometimes... If the bladder is filled enough, you can see, you can be able to see a vesicourethral uh, stone the, at the VUR junction uh, in some cases. And our X ray, again, most 95% of ureteric stones, about 90% of ureteric stones are radio opaque, except for like uh, the 16, uh, uric acid stones, which are not, uh, which are radio lucent. And uh, so uh, this was the line of thought at this point. CBC, again, to look for any infection because sometimes you can have uh, blocks down, uh, basically block uh, stone uh, causing hydronephrosis and these patients could be diabetic, could end up developing pyelonephritis and infections. Certain stones like, again, magnesium, aluminum uh, phosphate is again, uh, you, is because, because of repetitive UTIs, that's what we call struvite stones. So again, urine routine microscopy can give us an idea, urine culture can give us an idea of an ongoing un u urine infection. Creat and blood urea is important because sometimes that decides the plan of management. If the creatine is high, we'll go for an operative management to, to release the pressure on the kidney and to improve the renal function. So that is something we look at while treating uh, ureteric colic. Do you want me to stop here or you want me to go to treatment? Um, I'll just make one point here. So um, as Nathaniel clearly said, in the resource limited area, CT might not be available. And you can't keep ferrying patients to a fire destination to get a CT, which may or may not give you anything. USD is tricky in ureteric colics because it can evaluate your POJ, that is your pelvic ureteric junction and your vesicular ureteric junction very well. Everything in between is hidden by ball gas. Okay, so it becomes a little tricky depending on where you're at and how good and trained your radiologist is. An X-ray KUB can also throw you off if there's something called as uh, pyro, you know, uh, pyrolithiasis that is kind of like calcification of your pelvic veins. That can give you a false feeling that it could be, uh, what do you call that, uh, erotic calculi. But X-ray KUB is known, you know, to help pick up something like, you know, emphysematous pyelonephritis and things like that. Though I won't comment too much on it, it's very low sensitivity. So USD is good, but don't take that as your definitive, right? A USD doesn't pick up stones. It's mostly somewhere in the middle, you know. A ureter has kind of four areas where it gets constricted. Another thing is XRKOB cannot be your go-to choice. Your serum creat can somewhat guide you, but it's usually compensated by the other side unless there's a bilateral stone. So suppose one kidney is not functioning because it's blocked. The other kidney kind of compensates. So that way, I'd say don't do a USG if that doesn't pick up. I mean, don't just don't just do a USG, and if that comes out as normal, don't think that you know you're you're free from uh, that diagnosis of ureteric colic. Do you ask the radi radiologist who does that to ch find out the size of the kidney compared to the other side? Right, in middle of the night, and everyone just wants to get it done with, and someone does a screening scan and miss it. No, always ask that if this hydronephrosis or something. Uh, I think Nathaniel will explain that further. It'll give you an idea that something's really blocked. Right? Um, other than that, I think, yeah, uh, treatment is based on the size of the stone. I'll From here, I'll give it to Nathaniel. I think he'll explain that a bit. Yeah. So going to the, like I said, this picture, uh, can you go to the next slide? Yeah. So I am really sorry about this, but because the X-ray here, if you see, I don't know if anyone can spot, uh, the stone is actually on the left side. I didn't get like a picture with, for the stone on the right side, but if you see, there's a small stone, like a radio, you, can you, are you able to use the marker or something, Daniel? 
Can you just find out the stone for them on the left? No, no, it's down, it's down. It's the VUJ junction. VHA, yeah. Yeah, the right down oh. here. Yeah, exactly. So that's that's where the stone is. I, I didn't get a picture. It's actually a left-sided stone. Sorry for the confusion, but it is just to show you what a stone probably would look like or something. But again, like uh, like uh, Dr. Sayed said, do not get carried away with uh, like if you don't see a stone or if you see something, sometimes it may, but if it fits you. So the thing is to look at everything in a clinical point of view. You Clinical, join yeah. all the dots together. So if you see a right-sided pain with a right-sided uh, hydronephrosis on the USG. Like, see, can you see the U? I mean, all of you, I can, I'm sure y'all can see the, I see a lot of you can see. So what the picture here, can you, can you join the picture, show the picture on the, on the urinary bladder, Daniel? Yeah, the urinary bladder, can you point to that? Yeah, yeah. So, so this you see the stone on the left side there, which is throwing like an acoustic shadow. So that's that's what a a VUJ stone would look like on on a bladder scan, on a basically an ultrasound scan. That's what a VUJ stone would look like, which is throwing like a shadow here. It's quite um, hyper dense when throwing. Uh, not you call it hyper echoic, sorry, in ultrasound, and which is throwing like an acoustic shadow there. So if you look at the kidney, the picture on the left is like a normal kidney. And then the picture on the right shows some dilatation at the pelvic calicial junctions. And that is what a hydronephrosis would look like. So if you see a picture like this on an ultrasound with hydronephrosis on the right side, again, a stone on the right side with the VUJ junction and the sim patient symptoms are also on the right side then you can join all these things together and say, okay, you know, this is the diagnosis. But if you have these, sometimes you have investigations with just, you know, you'll have bilateral hydronephrosis and then a patient's complaining of only one-sided pain. And, you know, you might take take it for granted that it could be that, but uh, it could be something else for all you know. So you, you should try to join the investigations and the clinical presentation to get a better picture and don't just get carried away with the imaging. That's the point I would say from this. Uh, could you take the next slide, please? So yes, main important treatment again, pain relief. NACID is always above opioids. The reason for NACID is being is diclofenac, which is a very, very good drug, unless people abuse it. Like you have people in Anikal who just be like, sir, uh, injection, give me injection, give me injection. But you can use that a lot because it, kind of helps uh, also cause some amount of reduction, smooth muscle relaxation. So diclofenac is a very, very good drug uh, to be used for pain relief in patients with ureteric colic. Again, the treatment is based on the so, uh, size of the stone. If you have less than five millimeters, it's just watchful waiting, just pain relief regularly, excessive hydration, ask them to drink a lot of water, and if it's between 5 to 10, you can start on Tamsulosin, which is 4.4 mg. It's a very safe drug, uh, given mostly at night, because again, it causes some amount of postural hypertension. So preferably give it at night for a period of two weeks. Ask them to follow up after one week. If it's more than 10 millimeters, it is mostly unlikely to pass by, uh, what do you say, medical expulsion therapy. That's what we use Tamsulosin for. So in those cases, you will have to probably refer to a urologist for operative management, which basically ureteroscopy and DJ stenting and all of that shown to mobile. A uh, very important point in this is, I mean, actually it's coming in the next slide, is to look at persistent symptoms, even after one week, even after two weeks, they're having persistent pain. There is no indication clearly to do a repeat scan after two, three weeks if the patient has no symptoms. You don't need to repeat to see, oh, he sees hydronephrosis reduced or not. But he's having continuous symptoms even after two, three weeks then it will be important to rescan or probably go for a CT and to plan for operative management. But till then, I don't think, uh, I have not read, come across anywhere where they say you need to do a repeat scan if the patient is symptomatically better. Important point in this case is to know when to refer. It's important to refer in phase of fever and patient is septic. When I say septic, I mean it is just cell scoring. So you just look at if he's hypotensive, if he's tachycardic, if he's looking toxic to you, toxic means like febrile, he's sick, 
then that is very because that could suggest that he has a pyelonephritis and is going into bacteremia and sepsis, which is something I don't think if you are alone and in a primary care center, it is very because he might need early pressors, he'll need heavy antibiotics, he might even need an ICU because these things cannot be played around with. So I would suggest referring it out, very important to refer this patient. If it's bilateral obstructive stones, because then it can severely impair the renal function. If it's the only kidney that he has and he's got an obstructive stone, again, it's very risky, can uh, cause, again, renal damage and uh, uh, renal failure in a patient with CKD. And again, a patient, in, in mostly in pregnant women, because uh, uh, dealing with stones and management of stones in pregnant women is very complex. So I would not suggest you dealing with it in, in a primary setup. That's all. Anything you want to add, Dr. Sir? Uh, yeah, so like uh, Nathaniel's covered most of the important points. Uh, I'm actually happy with what he's done so far. NSAIDs, way to go. NSAIDs, NSAIDs, NSAIDs. Because, you know, they help at least get the spasmodic pain under control, right? You give the patient more time to think, relax, and then make a decision. Uh, regarding the size criteria, uh, it remains true. Okay, but there are a few places where the size criteria is kind of supported, uh, especially in your PUJ and VUJs. Right. So what happens in a vasoculatory junction? It's a very small, narrowed area, especially the intramural part of the ureter. And even uh, I've seen stone sizes of 3 mm, you know, kind of create an obstruction. So if that is the case, then uh, like he said, within one week, get the patient back. If, uh, you know, symptoms persist, then uh, possibly uh, tamsulos and all that will not help. He'll require surgical intervention. If this fever sepsis, definitely gram-negative sepsis compared uh, in uh, these uh, ure G genetic urinary tract-related issues, it's very deadly. Always refer soon. Bilateral obstructed stones, you know, obstructive uropathies. These are, again, very dangerous. A person can lose his life and kidneys and become dialysis dependent. So you have to be a bit careful on these. And uh, other things I think Nathaniel has covered very well. If any questions, please put it up in the chat. I think we'll be free to help out. Post-diuresis, okay. What medical expulsion therapy or medical uh, MET it's called, okay? Or MHT or medical hydration therapy. In this, what they used to do before was they used to give a dose of corticosteroid, a diuretic such as Lasix, uh, pain analgesics like NSAIDs and whatnot. But what people found, no, after systematic analysis is you're kind of trying to force water through an obstructed pipe. And the more the you're the kidney works, more urine is created. If the stone passes through, good for you. If, however, the stone, like I said, even a 3 mm stone can block your VUJ, if that happens, the kidney can go for a toss because the back pressure will cause severe dysfunction. In fact, people have gone into AT and that's acute tubular necrosis within 12 hours of a medical expressional therapy as well. So uh, giving diuretics, corticosteroids, and, doing, and flushing the body with, you know, two pints of saline such as NS and all that is considered old and it is actually considered dangerous for a patient. So uh, other than tamsulosin that's used to relax and hopefully pass off the stone without much incidence is actually better than doing something called as, you know, the hydration therapy or expulsion where they use diuretics, they flush the body with NS and whatnot. Because I said, it's a block system. If by chance the blockage is not overcome by whatever you're doing, you're creating a lot of back pressure on the kidney and the kidney can go for a toss. So other than tamsulosin, don't do anything else. If the patient is sick, if the patient is not recovering, the colicky pain is getting worse, refer the patient for a surgical intervention. Don't try your hand on more diuretics and more salines. Uh, you're going you're gonna to end up in a soup. Any yeah, other there was questions? another... Uh, another thing that I, I came across, where I've seen, I'm not sure, yeah. is tamsulosin. They give tamsulosin with deflacot. I'm not sure whether that helps yeah. because they say it causes some amount of uh, reduction in inflammation at the uretric uh, junction, yeah. like the VUJ junction. But I, I don't know because I've read a few papers which say it's beneficial. Some say it's not. So I'm not sure about that. It's not, yeah. No, I've come across a lot of systematic analysis on the same which argues against usage because, you know, just giving more uh, chemicals to the patient rather than helping. Yeah. Tamsulose and alpha-1 drug blockers, please go ahead. It, it is time-tested and it works wonders. In fact, stone size of 8 mm also have passed through just tamsulose. Prevent the spasm, the ureter dilates, that itself just passes off the stone. 
but uh, hydration therapy like diuresis diuretics with saline all that is is a kind of risky maneuver especially in a peripheral center don't go ahead with that if that's if it leads to some complications it's very difficult to manage okay okay uh, next slide any other questions on this case anyone or they'll just take questions later right yeah i mean any time any time they can just put it in the chat i think we can we, we can we'll have a uh, discussion session in the end anyway uh, so we can do that yeah yeah all right yeah I'm sure. fine with it yeah please please so this the next case is a 48 year old male which is again i'm not going to ask anyone to read cuz no one <laughs> very shy <laughs> scared of us yeah the 48 year old male with known case of diabetes type 2 hypertension uh, diabetes uh, type 2 with um, rheumatoid arthritis he's on man treatment he complains of pain on and off in the epigastric region for about 4 days progressed to involve the entire abdomen since one day is complaining of fever since the past two days vomiting four to five episodes uh, per day for the past two days with which is non bilious uh, he has history of constipation obstipation since two days and abdominal distension since a day and decreased urine output since one day what are the differentials does anyone want to give a chart come on guys please don't be so shy we're not going to eat you up can you please someone say what do you think anyone Hello? oh someone said intestinal obstruction okay good that's one of the dds anything else anyone else what's that did someone say okay perforated peptic ulcer very specific not bad <laughs> yeah okay so yeah so like both of them said even for me the the differentials at this point again would be uh perforation peritonitis and acute intestinal obstruction because perforation i would suggest one thing that falls in favor of an ulcer or perforation pe- perforated peptic ulcer would be because he's a patient on ra so they are mostly on pain meds and acids so they are at risk of developing uh uh peptic ulcer or peptic ulcer disease which is perforated again uh, this patient also has history of um, initially starting with pain and uh, uh, then progressing to having distension and then fever and vomiting so it's just going more from like a perfor- an initial perforation that has again developed into uh, peritonitis and now it's gone into an acute abdomen where everything has just shut down uh intestinal obstruction again he's got obstipation constipation but i feel i don't i'm not uh, uh dr said can correct me on that i feel it presents more with obstipation constipation vomiting and then pain and if uh, the other way around so i would keep that lower compared to perforation peritonitis uh, next slide please so yeah like i said acute uh, intestinal obstruction and perforation peritonitis would be my two dds anything you want to add mr dr said yeah so like he said uh, like nathaniel said it's very clear um, there is definitely some kind of an epigastric related issue and everything originated from there it got was uh, you put up acute intestinal obstruction uh, with the amount of distension coming on later and non bilious vomiting it's again it's going uh, the di- diagnosis should become secondary because you're dealing with something originating from the epigastrium chemical peritonitis or what not and it's getting getting worse and then the obstipation and everything else sets in that is bowel is you know it's not working anymore the vomiting can be secondary to nausea pain or whatever it is we're not sure but non bilious again you need to work your way around it if it's non bilious is something above the pylorus so it's simple if it's yeah. obstruction should be something more distal so this way i would say i would not rule out my diagnosis of obstruction yet but i would definitely go ahead with perforation primarily and then go with obstruction i would work yeah. around that line okay yeah so uh, any first diagnosis would be perforation peritonitis and then acute yeah. intestinal obstruction on the which is lower down okay so in this for evaluation uh, particularly again uh, clinically on examination uh, he was uh, 
tachycardic about 110 bp was around 90 60 saturation was 94 at room air with a temperature of 100 degrees fahrenheit grbs was around 72 uh general appearance Uh, suggested dehydration his tongue was dry probably not eating for the past two three days uh per abdomen appeared tense generalized tenderness was present rebound tenderness was present guarding as well as rigidity which are all very classical signs sometimes you don't see these classical signs but yeah bowel sounds were uh, absent uh pr the rectum was empty there was no stools in the rectum or there was uh and provisional diagnosis at this point would be again perforation peritonitis so a few things in this is see he's a little tachycardic his blood pressure is on the lower side so he is probably going in for sepsis at one point of time he's going in for sepsis again it could be blood pressure just low because of hypovolemia cuz he's just vomiting vomiting not taking anything in dehydration again could so his symptoms of hypovolemia and so he he could be having hypovolemia because his blood pressure is around 90 60 again a low grbs that would also be an early sign of again sepsis and again because he's having reduced intake uh, all the classical abdominal uh, signs of peritonitis are present in him uh, so i will go ahead uh, an examination i mean on investigation with uh, next slide please so i would do an imaging uh, probably an x ray which is actually erect chest with uh, cbc serum electrolytes um an rft because he's having decreased urine output and uh, basically since i'm already thinking of it being a possibility of perforation peritonitis i would even send his routine bloods if he's possible to go for theater uh in this x ray like you can see here there's this is a chest first the uh, the middle is a chest x ray uh showing air and a diaphragm on the right side uh some patients sometimes cannot have a chest erect x ray and um, uh so you can what you can do is put them in left lateral position for about 5 minutes and look at uh, what we call as lateral decubitus x ray showing a thin um air under diaphragm on the right side again uh the third x ray that you see here is basically dilated bowel loops and you can see that there is thinning of air if you look at just just on the right of the spine right in the middle at l1 l2 spine you can see that there's a wall that is there and it is really uh, it is uh, the intestinal wall has gas on the inside as well as on the outside so this is what we call as uh, so you basically you can see that there there's a clear demarcation of the uh, wall which is suggestive of air outside the bowel as well so it is um, i don't remember what what is the sign called <laughs> regular regular sign yeah regular sign yeah sorry uh, regular, regular sign. sign so it's very very classical uh, picture of that so yeah so with this uh, in mind uh, since there's a definite diagnosis at this point of perforation peritonitis my initial management would be resuscitation because he looks quite sick dehydrated so i would give him any cids next next slide please so we'll keep him npo mainly because we don't want him taking anything else because he that will worsen the peritonitis get to keep him npo give a adequate fluid resuscitation 20 to 30 ml per kg body weight of fluid bolus over 1 hour should be uh, fine and uh, put in an ng tube to try to decompress the bowel because that will relieve a lot of symptoms relieve the distension give a good antibiotic coverage probably a third generation cefalosporin with metronidazole for an anaerobic cover catheterization very important to look at input and output because these patients with peritonitis with worsening symptoms can go into acute renal failure probably because of the dehydration that is pre renal failure and then prepare him for an expiratory laparotomy if you don't have a, a setup saying for an expiratory laparotomy you don't have an ot you don't have a surgeon it is at least do the bare minimum of this and refer the patient make sure you tell because sometimes 
you know like cuz i worked in a tribal area which is really remote and a lot of times we te- we refer patients and we sometimes we don't tell them you know don't feed someone because they always think you know i'm going to the hospital and i want to go into the hospital and because i'm going to be there for a while i might as well have some good food before i go to the hospital so these kind of things are thoughts that have that are that that um, are there in the in the community and in people who are um not able to understand uh, the situations it's very important to tell them do not feed him anything put in an ng tube decompress the ball resuscitate adequately with fluids catheterize give the antibiotic if you give an a major antibiotic it really helps and then uh, refer to wherever there's surgical capabilities with your uh, diagnosis anything you want to add yeah so um can you just go to the examination of the vitals and abdomen and everything just everything's covered beautifully there is a few things i'd like you guys to notice again he looks toxic he's tachycardic so don't wait around for things start a resuscitation then and there at the same time so everything should be going hand in hand like nathaniel has mentioned everything right it's a multiple slides everything goes hand in hand there's generalized tenderness there's rebound tenderness so one thing is in these patients usually the abdomen is tense and you can't keep you know trying to elicit rebound tenderness one clinical key of how you can do it is simple percussion on percussion if there severe pain that itself is equivocal to your rebound tenderness okay if there is rigidity is rigid that it is bold like rigidity don't do anything and empty rectum is also another sign that you know something is going on higher up a colonic pathology will never have an empty rectum something higher up beyond or proximal to the ileocecal junction is going on okay in pr so when you see an empty rectum roomy rectum and what not think of small bowel pathology a few things quirks and points i thought i'll give it to you guys and uh, next slide after this yeah so another thing that nathaniel has mentioned here but i'd like to emphasize on the position for lateral decubitus x rays is always left lateral always left lateral okay because sometimes you get confused you're in a hurry you go ahead with the light lateral and what not it's always left lateral because the liver creates a resistance for the bowel to flow into that area so any air that collects there will be collected well and it will be preserved well so your x-ray will show it 5 minutes wait is another thing that nathaniel's mentioned has to be adhered to so if the patient is tolerating this then go ahead with that if the patient is able to stand another small trick you can do is put an ngt take a 20 cc syringe and push in 100 ml of air that increases the pneumo and maybe your chest x-ray can catch it better don't go checking for this sign this crescent sign on an abdominal x-ray is another small thing a tip that i'd like to give it's always on a chest x-ray and the other thing is if you if the patient is extremely moribund but you need a diagnosis you have a supine x-ray only then the regular sign ligamentum td sign football abdomen sign are a few things that you can even look up if you have your books refer back to them because in a practical situation you'll have to use your brains uh, you can't panic and just do off something few key investigations like a cbc sc and rft and at the same time if you think the patient is very sick you have the surgical capabilities in your hospital just you know prep the ot and send blood for coagulation to, to determine how perioperative care should be uh, the next slide after this so i'll just be touching on few key important points i think which is important to do and explain why it's important to do here especially an ng tube insertion is a very important need right so suppose you have a perforation right hollow viscous perforation in case the patient didn't come with epigastric related pain and just vague abdominal central abdominal pain the perforation might be somewhere more distal in that case an ng tube helps because one it takes away all your gastric right it's 4 liters above the diaphragm 4 liters below the diaphragm and your gastric is around you know 2 to 2.5 liters so it decompresses the bowel by first taking away all the stomach secretions and to preventing the amount of secretions that go beyond the pylorus stimulating further uh, secretions by a cholecystokinin so you're not only decompressing your stomach you're decreasing the amount of secretions from your pancreatic and biliary system as well so your ngt will even cover any distal perforations so keep the patient npo shove in an ng if you're thinking it's perforation you have reas- you know good amount of a uh, reasonable amount of doubt go ahead and put an ng it will help the patient sometimes might not be compliant what is supposed to get it done and don't be in a rush to sh- you know just shift the patient outside somewhere because you think he'll die you know in uh, during my pg days 
uh, perforation comes at you know night 10 pm we'd call our consultants and they'll be like ha yeah yeah we'll take a morning 6 am so perforation until and unless the patient requires vasopressor support you have time hydrate the patient resuscitate the patient try to overcome the metabolic acidosis to some degree and the best way to determine if a resuscitation is helping or not is by charting the urine output so foley catheterization also becomes important here so suppose you are in a tribal area the ambulance is going to take 2 hours to come here and is going to take the patient 3 hours to reach wherever it is if it's vasopressor support your hands are tied you don't have to you know hope to god that you know it happens quickly if not these are the things that you'll have to do put an ngt catheterize the patient start resuscitating him well start overturning his metabolic acidosis if you can give him the antibiotic care he needs and then go ahead and do the needs so i hope this much could have helped you a little bit more you know uh order the streamline your approach to this patients okay nathaniel i'll give it back to you yeah and another thing is so, like uh, another thing uh, with sir said you, to deal with metabolic acidosis many a places sometimes you do not have abg to check your resuscitation you don't know whether is acidosis alkalosis all of that uh, electrolytes uh, definitely some most places have but a good way to know resuscitation if you see in if you see it in babies also one of the best ways to know it clinically is to look at output like sir said so looking at the urine output will give you that you know you've done an adequate fluid resuscitation if you don't have lactates and you don't have pure metabolic acidosis or you know abg to see all of these things so clinically also you can come to know if the patient uh, is adequately resuscitated or not so that's very important because sometimes if you don't adequately resuscitate like so uh, a lot of surgeons would will know one when they go to ot mm-hmm. these people if, if if you're not adequately resuscitated uh, the outcomes post surgery is really bad so resuscitation is very key in these patients so that they are fit to be operated in for for this for the definitive management next slide please Did someone say something? I don't know. No, the chat is empty. Yeah. Oh, okay, fine. If you're okay. not in doubt, speak up. If there's any issues, you can just put it in the chat. We'll be able to see that. Okay. So we're going to the third case. Uh, this is a 27-year-old male with a right lower abdomen pain since three days, fever since two days, nausea. Uh, she's complaining of some three to four episodes of diarrhea two days ago. anyone uh, he's complaining of diarrhea two to three days uh, ago and what do you think is the dds for this anyone you can put it up in the chat no anyone dds come on guys are you all sleeping i know it's a very cozy <laughs> day Is it? Uh, yeah. So someone okay. said appendicitis. Uh, that's a very good call. Anything else? Any other? Again, right lower abdominal pain. Again, the same DDs, but this is a male, so you don't have ectopic pregnancy and ovarian torsion. <laughs> but yeah, appendicitis again, urinary colic. It can still be urinary colic because sometimes um, just irritation can cause. Uh, but again, the, the diarrhea doesn't fit. that fell in urinary colic so next slide please so on uh, examination his heart rate is around 100 bp is 110 90 is febrile uh, saturation of 98 there's some minimal tenderness there's re- uh, there's some amount of guarding in the rif and these bowel sounds are present so my provisional diagnosis at this point would be acute appendicitis go to the next slide please Yeah, so these are a few signs that you see in appendicitis. Look at tenderness. You on the right side, if you see there's there is re, there's rebound. There's something called Rousing signs where you basically uh uh, uh what do you say uh you compress on the on the left. You basically check for tenderness in the left iliac fossa, and then there's a there's a rebound tenderness in the right iliac fossa when you're palpating the left. then so our sign is when there's extension of the psoas which is basically the hip flexors when you extend them because of irritation of the psoas muscle you get pain obturator sign is again internal rotation irritation of the obturator can cause pain again 
So like the lab's investigations given, next, next slide, please. So I would investigate by doing a CBC and ultrasound abdomen to look for probably uh, a dilated appendix, appendicolate, which is again, sometimes very difficult to find. I know people think that radiologists are, are making it up, but sometimes it's very difficult to, to <laughs> find an appendix on an ultrasound and, and all surgeons get really annoyed because they don't <laughs> see them. But 90% yeah. of the time, uh, an appendicitis is a clinical diagnosis. Uh, so you have the Alvarado score. I'm sorry, I didn't, don't have a slide to put it up, but you can look up the Alvarado score. And if the score is high, you can obviously, it, it is more likely appendicitis. So here this patient has rebound tenderness, which scores, a, a tenderness which scores two, he's got fever, he's got a white cell count elevated with neutrophilic shift, all of that suggesting of appendicitis. You, so the main treatment again is antibiotics. Now, this is a very, uh, which is again, um, cephalosporin with uh, uh, with uh, anaerobic cover. So now there's a huge uh, thing, uh, a huge, what do you say, different change in management nowadays with respect to appendectomy versus conservative management of appendicitis. And there's a huge, uh, what do you say, a debate going on. I think Dr. Syed would be the better person to give us yeah. inputs on that. But um, if there's, uh, in what I, well, from what I read is if there is, no appendicolate, there is no dilated appendix, there's no suggestion of probable, uh, uh, you know, uh, what do you say, a nasty looking appendix, then I think it's more likely to go for a conservative management because they, most patients do well, unless it's a recurrent episode of appendicitis. Another thing is, again, if you have, if you have a long standing, like what we call uh, uh, and uh, basically an appendicular mass, then it's definitely conservative management by Oshnesharian regimen. So I would like actually Dr. Sayer to give his inputs on what you think about whether appendectomy versus conservative and what do you think is the... Before that, do you yeah. want to go through this? I mean, it's you can let... Like okay. anything I mean, the case is... Yeah, no problem. The case is fairly straightforward. Pain abdomen, fever, nausea, and RIF pain. Uh, for a surgeon, that's the golden triangle or, or the golden triad or whatever appendix. It's something called the Murphy's triad, by the way, uh, uh, and the McBurney's triad, if you guys are interested in seeing through. That's clinical and examination-wise. And examination-wise, McBurney's tenderness is definitely positive in this patient. But that is not a criteria. Clinical, it's, it's a clinical diagnosis, yes, but a McBurney's tenderness is not a criteria for me to operate. As for the new guidelines, there should be obvious signs of peritonism. That is your rebound tenderness. That is your involuntary guarding. Okay. And there should be an obvious sepsis in the patient in the sense the leukocyte counts are elevated. The patient has gone an ongoing febrile episode. Okay. Uh, which is dependent on some kind of an antipyretic. And the patient should be septic. So the recent study is, okay. So again, I'll just recap here. Fairly straightforward case. For me, the first thing I jumped to, no other organ, I'd say appendix, very boldly and arrogantly. Uh, the other thing is, how would I approach this case? Uh, actually, a study, a systematic analysis, uh, and uh, multiple RCTs have been done over the last 10 years on appendix alone. Right? One is about diagnosis. We have our Alvarado, modified Alvarado, where tenderness has been removed. Again, it's not such a big criteria. So tenderness has been removed. Just Senakis score and a few other scores in pediatric patients. Okay, Please read up on this. It's required. Because in peripheral centers, you will not have an access to an ultrasound or other things. So please keep this in mind. Even ultrasound, you need to know when to operate, when not to operate. So when the patient comes you comes with you, something called as a non-appendicolith appendix, that is your catheteral appendicitis. It's simple lymph node enlargement that's blocked the lumen of the appendix, and therefore an appendix has happened. But irrespective of that, even if there's an appendicolith, they say you can go ahead with conservative care. There should be, again, like I reiterate, no rebound tenderness. That is obvious signs of peritonism. There should be no collections. There should be no obvious sepsis in the patient that is in SIRS, you know, like tachycardic, tachypneic and whatnot. And finally, it should be the first episode in the patient in the last six months or the only episode in the last six months. If that is the case, then you can go ahead with something called as conservative care because only 10% of the appendicitis recur over a period of 10 years. So they say... Instead of going ahead and removing, again, the appendix is not a vestigial organ anymore. It helps in maintaining gut immune uh, health. 
and it also helps in some you know uh, recolonization of the bacteria so suppose you flooded your system with some antibiotics the recolonization of your colon starts from the appendix so it's not a vestigial organ anymore it is very intricately related in your gut health your immune health and also uh, removing an appendix has shown to increase your ca colon risk by 2% sadly i've had it removed so i'm at risk so in this page so how do we go about this entire osno sherens regimen conservatively like i said only 10% recur over 10 years so can you if the patient is not very sick and septic can you leave it behind the answer is yes in most european countries in fact they don't even it is not considered anymore they do more cholecystectomies and appendicectomies so how do you go about osno sherens regimen Uh, you've covered that or shall I cover that Nathaniel no i've not i've not covered that actually no just okay not, not a problem not a problem so osteosteroids regimen is basically you keep the patient npo give gut rest you give adequate amount of analgesics a good antibiotic coverage as nathaniel's put here and finally you observe the patient you maintain the vital start only three situations you discontinue osteosteroids regimen the pain is persisting with worsening fever the pain is spreading beyond the rif and there's a collection which on ct is more than 2.5 to 3 cm in its largest diameter there's no volume related largest diameter in this case you have to sadly abandon it and consider a surgical intervention so appendicectomy was conservative definitely conservative because studies are proven but always keep rechecking and double rechecking the patient make sure you're not missing anything the patient going into sepsis you know because especially in the elderly the young and the pregnant it becomes a bit tricky to do you do should you not do because elderly people the momentum is not that good you know it will perforate earlier in children the momentum is very small so it doesn't go cover the infection so it, especially the tip it perforates faster and pregnant women you're dealing with two lives if the appendix perforates the chances of fetal loss is 20%. In fact, it's one of the most common extra uterine emergencies they say in pregnant women. So appendicectomy was a conservative, I would say it's depending on this three at risk people and the other normal people who you'll have to, you know, judge based on clinical criteria. Obviously it comes with experience, but I hope it's making some sense. Um so any questions anything like that you like to put forth? Anything else you'd like to add, Nathaniel, to this? Nah, no, no. I think uh, I think it's a very uh, what do you say uh, experience thing that that most exactly yeah. So after seeing a lot of appendicitis, that they generally are yeah. like you know we'll manage this conservatively and not. So, but so yeah, start for picking them, up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's the take home point from this. Everyone uh, got, I guess. uh can we go to the next as anyone have any questions no i don't think very They're silent crowd is dead they are all <laughs> like scared of us or got to sleep i don't know all right so okay. the next case is a 47 year old diabetic with history of uh, resection and astomosis for a, a large bowel obstruction 2 years ago he complains of constipation since the five days uh, complains of abdominal distension since three days with diffuse abdominal pain vomiting which is bilious this time decrease appetite and um, decrease urine output anyone with a diagnosis come on guys at least type the diagnosis please very good someone said bowel obstruction due to additions that that is quite a good uh, thought process again because he's got a previous surgery so anything that is uh, operated previously is most likely to develop additions uh, in the future so yeah an uh, an obstruction so what do you specify where do you think is the possible obstruction do you think it's a large bowel or a small bowel what do you think would you call it acute would you call it sub acute okay fine so let's go ahead someone answering or someone speaking i don't know okay anyway uh next next slide so yeah on examination our heart rate is about 100 uh, beats per minute is someone talking daniel i don't know i'm just hearing some if anybody wants to ask a question you can uh, 
just have to raise your hand. It'll be easier for us to know who is speaking. Or you can put it in the chats. Okay. I, I think it was just some noise in the background. Yes. Well. All right. OK, so heart rate of 100 beats per minute, BP of around 120, 80. Temperature is normal. Saturation is normal. GRVI is of around 200. His uh, abdomen appears slightly tense, uh, distended. There's diffuse tenderness. Bowel sounds are present. Uh, per rectal examination, the rectal mucosa is normal. There's no feces, and the rectum is empty. What do you think is the provisional diagnosis? You think it's small bowel, it's large bowel. So with all of this, because the rectum is empty, there was there's more of bilious vomiting. It looks like it's beyond the pylorus, so it mostly might be a small bowel obstruction, uh, in my opinion. Uh, and again, um, so how we in investigate this would be, uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Yeah, so we'll get an X-ray, a CBC, an RFT, and electrolytes again. While we are doing that, it's also important because this patient needs to be resuscitated. So again, he needs fluids. He needs to be on um, probably. So the X-ray would show, like in the left, you can see multiple air fluid levels uh, with, uh, and in the central X-ray, you can see uh, the hostrations and dilated large bowel. In the X-ray on the extreme right, you see dilation, which which has the valvular conventus, which is suggestive of a a uh, small bowel obstruction. So these are three, uh, two different. There's uh, the middle showing a large bowel obstruction with a dilated large bowel loop. And the right side is showing a small bowel obstruction with the valvular conventus. Uh, in X-ray, I don't know. I mean, uh, Dr. Syed would give, be better telling you this, but mostly in CT is what I remember. Say, they say that uh, the criteria for is three, six, nine. Three for small bowel, more than three centimeter dilated loops in small bowel, more than six centimeter dilated loops in the large bowel, and more than nine centimeters for the cecum and the sigmoid colon. Um, with respect to air fluid levels, anything more than three to five air fluid levels will be uh, suggestive of an uh, acute intestinal obstruction or intercell obstruction per se. In this case, uh, when you go to the next, and managing the patient, again, it'll be M NPO, decompress the bowel with uh, an NG tube, uh, fluid resuscitation, and Foley's catheterization. With respect to antibiotic cover, I have not really, uh, I'm not very sure about that. So I would like to, uh, Dr. Syed to give inputs on that, yeah. about whether we should cover these patients with antibiotics or not. Uh, but uh, other than that, this would be the, diagnosis. I mean, this would be the uh, early primary management in this patient. And then again, this patient will need further imaging and whether like he needs operative versus conservative management would be. If it's acute intestinal obstruction, of course, with a, it need, um, it'll need uh, immediate surgical management because then the bowel will go into ischemia. But with respect to uh, this, we also need to rule out other causes like pseudo obstruction, like in terms of hypokalemia. So you look at electrolytes and all these uh -huh. things uh, as well. If there's hypokalemia and you need to correct those uh, electrolyte imbalances as well. Anything else? Uh, that's all for what I feel in terms of management in a primary setup that we can do. Anything you want to add, doctor? Uh, yeah, so patient obviously has undergone some kind of an operative uh, intervention previously. So once an abdomen is touched, it's not virgin anymore. So the most common cause in an operated abdomen is always, always additions 45% of the times. In fact, I'd go on a limb and even say 60% of the time. Very rarely it's some other cause. Uh, but once these patients present to you, right, you'll have to assess if the patient is one passing gas because tools is not a criteria. The bowel requires more force. The bowel peristalsis is determined by gas. Like once you make a stoma, we see gas coming out and then say, okay, bowel's functioning. So if the patient's part, there's no obstipation in this patient. So it's maybe subacute, not completely acute. And three is the type of vomitus. If it's bilious, beyond the pylorus. If it's feculent, it's beyond the ileocecal junction. So with, and the other thing you need to note in this patient is if by vomiting, the symptoms or the patient feels some kind of a relief. If that is the situation, then it's something in a small bowel. If despite vomiting, there's no relief, it's a large bowel. So things like that you need to keep in mind. A few, you know, uh, pointers that I would say. 
that when you're assessing a patient, especially with obstruction. The other thing is if you can go to the X-ray, uh, this thing, uh, Dr. Daniel, the X-ray slide, yeah. So the best X-ray to have for an obstruction patient is always supine. Okay. If the patient can stand on what not, an erect, okay. But the three things that you need to see is obviously air flow levels. There are usually three gas shadows that you can see, the fundal, rectal, and somewhere in the middle uh, periumbilical region. If there are more than five air flow levels, significant. But the character or the manner in which the air fluid levels is important. Step ladder pattern, central, small bowel. If it's large bowel with an intact or patent ileocecal junction, there's again few other things that you'll have to see. For example, air fluid levels more peripherally than centrally. But even in obstruction cases, even in the step ladder form, check for gas in the rectum. If there is gas in the large colon, then you know for a fact it's not an acute obstruction. See, I might not, I might not even require a CT in this case because it's addition related. Uh, provided the horneal orifices are normal, I know 60% of the time it's additions. And the dictum or the dogma is for addition related obstructions, wait for 72 hours until unless the patient is toxic or has signs of strangulation that is diffuse tenderness and lactate, uh, diffuse tenderness, lactates are high, tachycardic, sick looking, you know, the, the acidotic breathing and whatnot. If not, wait for 72 hours. But if it's a virgin abdomen with an intact hernial orifice, an obstruction should not see the rising and setting sun, is what the dogma is. So you see an X-ray, you see the air fluid levels, you check for gas in the colon. If it's there, if it's a previously operated case, take it a bit slow on the patient. Give some bowel rest, let the edema reduce, and the ball itself starts functioning. So it's not because so it's not really big of an issue. But if it's a virgin abdomen, you know. Keep yourself a bit more uh, uh, kind of, you know, alert that it could be something more sinister. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, yeah. So Nathaniel raised this question about antibiotics. Personally, until this, I see signs of infection or signs, you know, not just dehydration. Like patient is septic, febrile. I don't give antibiotics. There is this pro and con that, you know, non-functional bowel, the bacteria starts to translocate beyond the bowel because it needs food to eat. But I don't usually follow that because eventually everything that you give is a chemical to the patient. If it's not indicated, wait, resuscitate, give bowel, adequate bowel rest that is decompress the bowel, the patient itself, patient will recover him or herself. But one thing in which you have to give antibiotics irrespective of the degree of obstruction is large bowel obstruction. Okay, there is a higher percentage or concentration of bacteria per square centimeter of the large bowel. Give antibiotics, three, four days should be fine. The patient should settle and get it evaluated. If it's addition related, you're in the green. If it's an elderly lady, virgin abdomen, they get a colonoscopy and figure what's happening. Okay, and in PR, like uh, was mentioned here, it was empty rectum. Okay, so not just empty rectum, roomy rectum also becomes important for me. Because again, like I said, if it's roomy rectum, something in the small ball. If it's something to do, and also if you're doing a rectal examination, check your finger stock. What's happening? Is there blood in it? Is there malina there? Is there something happening? If it's blood, then it's a colonic pathology, right? Is it normal stool? Is it mucoid stools? Again, colonic pathology. So things like that. These are small tips that I thought that I think is helpful, you know, when you're evaluating a case like an obstruction. But in this case, it's quite straightforward, it's addition related. Wait and watch, the patient should settle. You have 72 hours. If the patient does not settle in 72 hours, then reassess and go ahead with surgery because you don't have a choice. And 80% of the times they say the additions after additionalysis form again and again and again. So that, that has to be explained to the patient, sadly. We don't have any other way of averting an addition formation. There are a few surgeries like Noble's procedure and all uh, with uh, very less success rate. Okay, Nathaniel, I'll just close myself here. Yeah. So yeah, in this case, because it's already an operated, we can you can still manage it in your center up till 72 hours, like doctor said, but you have to be keep a low threshold for if you feel like the patient's going to seps. Daniel, we are not able to hear you. I don't know whether there is. Uh, and then you might have to refer the patient. But up till 72 hours, if the patient's subsiding with like give the bowel rest, decompression, fluid resuscitation, 
and patients getting better, he should generally improve within 72 hours. Because once I operated again, you're going to operate and it's just going to get worse and worse from there. Um, next slide, please. Next case. Yeah, so this is just a picture of what uh, uh, basically a hernia, I think, that was um, that was presented with obstruction. Uh, Doctor Sayed sent me this picture, so this is just to yeah. like you know to look at it and and see. I think you will give better about what happened with this patient. Yeah, he was a scrotal abdomen case. Happily lived with it for twenty years for whatever reasons, and one fine day he went into obstruction. Luckily, the bowel was still viable. So we could just reduce it and uh, go ahead with the hernioplasty. The key point why I sent this image to Nathaniel and I wanted to be included in the PPT is hernial orifices, hernial orifices, hernial orifices. When you come across an obstruction case, don't just see the abdomen and forget the entire hernial orifice and genital examination. You'll miss a hidden hernia. Even a small direct hernia can cause obstruction, really bad obstruction. A richer hernia itself can cause a bad obstruction. So using this picture, Keeping it in mind, this is one point I wanted to, you know, clear up for everyone. Mm. Yeah, it's very important to include that in your examination. Hernal orifices and uh, a PR examination it should be the complete examination for any abdomen. When you uh, examine any abdomen, make sure you complete this as well. And hernal orifices, uh, like if you go back to med school, you will obviously know that you have to examine them in standing position because I think me and Dr. Sayed mm -hmm. has a, had, a, had a case like this before in the A&E. Yeah. She just complained of pain, pain, and she, uh, we just did not see a hernia. And then she got up to go to the loo and then she comes back with like a hernia, which is green. And, and it was something that we saw later on and we were like, you know, how did we miss that? How did I miss that? So it's always important to make sure you make the patient stand and cough and you know, see if there's like a, a reducible hernia that's there. Let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, so this is case five. It's a 48 year old male, farmer by occupation, known case of diabetes since 10 years on tab glimmy M2. He presented with swelling in the right leg associated with redness, with history of pain, with no history of trauma, and no history of, and uh, no history of fever. So what do you think are the diagnosis? What are the risk factors? And what do you think is the management for this patient? So what do you think is the diagnosis? Anyone? Pain, swelling in right lower limb. Cellulitis. Cellulitis, yeah, that, that's good. That's any other DD that you think? Pain, redness with swelling in the lower limb. DVT, yeah, very good. Anything else? So another nasty infection that also can present, uh, it's basically, it's worsens from cellulitis and it's very, very dangerous. Again, necrostizing fasciitis, which is again seen in a lot of diabetic and immunocompromised patients. So these are would be my DDs for now. Can we look at the picture, please? Next slide. So on examination, systemically, patient looks fine. Heart rate, uh, BP, vitals are normal. On local examination, that's what the limb looks like. Red, tender. Um, there is all your five cent, dollar, uber, calor, all of that. And you've got so there's you see there's there's a marking there that's there on the on the foot that's basically very important when you see any patient with cellulitis always remember because uh, you try to mark out where you can see the uh, the uh, inflammation tell because you you are going to follow up this patient once you put them on antibiotics and it's important to make sure that you know you see if there's any spread of an infection because every time you come you may not know. So marking is always helpful. Again, it's very important to examine the foot. A lot of these diabetic patients, like again, a lot of these diabetic patients don't have very poor uh, foot care. And uh, some of them are neuropathic. They don't have poor glycemic control. So they might have like, you can see in the picture up, they might have fissures there, which basically have bacteria stacked up into the subcutaneous and inflammation of the subcutaneous from there. Uh, that's why you have infection and inflammation of subcutaneous tissue from there. Go to the next slide. 
So again, in this patient, what do you think could be the risk factor? This is generalized risk factors in patients for uh, cellulitis and basically for poor healing wounds. So one of them is diabetes, vascular insufficiency, like patients with peripheral arterial disease, any history of trauma or a long-standing wound, any cracks or peeling on skin, patients who are immunocompromised, obese, and with history, when, and patients who have like edel, edel, uh, edema, maybe because of like uh, lymph lymphedema and all of those conditions, these patients are at risk of developing infection because uh, of these risk factors. And other important thing is, if you've noticed, this patient is a farmer, and a lot of people in rural India do not have a good. They don't have like they don't wear clothes footwear when they go out in the fields or all of that. So it's very important to know what is happening with this patient in terms of a social point of view, because um, many a times your patients, you'll treat them and then, you know, you don't, uh, you will treat the infection. That's not a problem. You give antibiotics, they get better, probably admit them for a day or two based on the severity. But when they go out there again, it's like the same process again and then coming back again with an infection. So it's very important when you discharge these patients to look at all these things as well. Next slide, please. Next slide. Yeah. So how would you investigate this? Again, CBC to look for any systemic infection. Uh, then uh, uh, again, RFT is very important. Uh, uh, imaging. Do you think uh, cellulitis needs imaging? Um, that's the question that, uh, so in some cases, if you've got like a diabetic foot infection, it's very important to look for cystic. Uh, osteomyelitis, but in cellulitis, you do not need an imaging. It's a clinical diagnosis. You can treat uh, it. Organisms mostly involved are beta hemolytic, streptococcus, staph aureus. In terms of severity, so the antibiotic you will choose for infection. So this, this is how we'll go ahead managing these patients. The antibiotic that you will choose is based on the severity, on the possible organism, and the type of the infection that you're dealing with. Uh, when you look at anti-edema measures, there's limb elevation, which is very important, compression dressings, or with um, glycerin max sulfate. Compression dressing also, there's a, there's a bit dicey situation with in terms of in peripheral vascular disease because they are uh, generally these patients can have worsening of wounds with compression because you're just reducing the flow down. Uh, next slide, please. Coming to the antibiotics, we've got, uh, this is, uh, so the antibiotics that we give is actually, so this slide what I've got is actually from uh, the national guidelines uh, of uh, basically the government guidelines that uh, is followed in most uh, places around India. Uh, so in cellulitis, when the possible organism mostly is your um, group A streptococcus and staph aureus, you can treat it with a first generation cephalosporin or amoxclav 1.2 IV uh, QA thoroughly. You can add plus minus clindamycin based on the severity. So clindamycin has a very good anaerobic cover. So you can give it for about five to seven days, extend it to about 40, uh, 14 days if the patient is clinically not improving. Important, again, if there's any wound to take wound cultures and treat your uh, and blood cultures if the patient's getting worse or septic. I would suggest in a peripheral setup, if you have just a localized cellulitis, it's, it, it is quite manageable with antibiotics, provided there's a, there's a regular follow-up, and you also make sure you have take care of the anti-edema measures and everything else. But if a patient's getting septic with cellulitis or with necrotizing fasciitis, it is something that needs to be referred to a higher center because these patients will need early operative management, debridement, will need IV antibiotics, might even go into severe sepsis and multi-organ failure. So if it's just cellulitis that you can manage with uh, antibiotics, you can go ahead, treat it for five to seven days. But if it's not improving after 14 days as well, it's better to refer to a higher center. Always consider polymicrobial pathogens when you're dealing with diabetics. So you're having in, if you're having immunocompromised people, when you think of polymicrobial, you're thinking of anaerobes, always add clindamycin, which is 600 mg. You can treat amoxiclav again, 625 mg, three times a day orally as well, or oral clindamycin as well for 600 mg, three times a day. In necrotizing fasciitis, this is a very, very nasty condition. Uh, these patients need uh, immediate debridement uh, and uh, removal of dead tissue. So these patients need early surgical management. If you have patients with necrotizing fasciitis, 
early referral is very important to a surgical center. Start with antibiotics and refer the patient because these need urgent surgical deployment. Do not waste time with these patients because this can lead to multi-organ failure. They can go into rhabdo, they can go into uh, renal failure and it's it's a downward trend from there. Uh, when you think, again, patients related to uh, exposure to fresh water, salt water, in these cases, this is the antibiotic of choice. That's ciprofloxacin and uh, doxycycline for about 14 days. And But again, in necrotizing fascia, it is very important to have adequate source control. And I mean source control. In any infection that is local, source control is very important. When I say, so when I say source control, I mean like an early operative debridement or uh, operative management for these patients because only if you treat the, there's no point of pushing in antibiotics when you're not treating the source of the infection. Can you go next? In Arcipalus and again in abscess, uh, these are the antibiotics of choice. You have amoxclav and clindamycin for uh, group A streptococcus. Uh, if you're thinking of methicillin sensitive staph aureus, you can give clindamycin. But if you think like the patient has probably MRSA, then it's linazolid and vancomycin. Always in an abscess, again, there's no, if you see an abscess anywhere, it is to be drained. There's no point in giving antibiotics because you see, I mean, I have seen people in peripheries, some doctors they just give antibiotics and they don't treat the, the abscess. So you have to drain the abscess because there's no way out for that. Next please, next, next slide, please. So this is what necrotizing fasciitis versus cellulitis would be. Patient would be quite toxic. Patient would be septic. Patient would be tachycardic with a very nasty looking limb. These patients need urgent debridement and uh, removal of all the dead tissue because this can be quite dangerous. Go next. Yeah. So this looks, so this is what necrotizing, sometimes it looks very, 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 uh, like a ce like cellulitis superficially, but then this is what's happening. There's a lot of dead tissue underneath, which you're actually missing out because you're just looking at it on a on a superficial point of view. So these kind of cases can get very dangerous because it starts eating up the muscles and the uh, tissues underneath. Next, next slide, please. Yeah, anything you want to add before I go to abscess and IND and all of that? Yeah, so uh, cellulitis is fairly common. It is uh, quite uh, so common, especially in your uh, peripheral centers. You know, foot hygiene is not maintained. Small infections, poor diabetic control, kind of go out of control. So, cellulite is like uh, Nathaniel rightly said. Mostly, it is just conservative, good antibiotic coverage, anti edema measures. But you'll have to look into one. Being a surgeon, I'll have to see if the cellulitis edema is not so bad that is causing compartment syndrome. So that is one situation in which a cellulitis case, I would go ahead with a fasciotomy. Because cellulitis is just the skin. That is your dermis, epidermis, and your subcutaneous tissue also gets infected. So, you know, a lot of edema can happen. A lot of fluid can get uh, collected, uh, edema fluid, and that can cause compression of the limb involved. So for me, compartment syndrome-related symptoms, I'll have to roll out. And if it's ruled out, well and good. Go ahead with compression, limb and elevation, good antibiotic coverage, and bed rest. Uh, if it's not, then I'd go ahead with fasciotomy to help relieve or, you know, hasten the recovery process just to and to prevent underlying issues. Necrotizing fasciitis is extremely dangerous. It's extremely dangerous. has to be operated as soon as possible. So there are more symptoms than signs. So suppose you see a limb. It, it doesn't look that bad. But the patient just, you know, cribbing and crying in pain. It's a little red, but the pain is beyond the area of redness. We can feel crepitus. When you're touching the leg, you feel like, you know, this bubble bursting sensations on the tip of your fingers. And you can feel, and you can see something called a dish, dish wash, uh, dish water pus. Kind of a pus that doesn't, it's more serious than purulent, but you see a lot of it coming out, right? But you know, it's pus, it's false smelling and whatnot, because anaerobic infection also takes place. It's polymicrobial. So in this case, necrotizing face is they always come already in mods. They, ha they, they really require good resuscitation before you do the surgery with very poor outcomes. Re the debridements, a lot of amputation, you know, ending up in amputations. So in that way, cellulitis, I'd keep an eye on compartment syndrome related issues. How to, you know, how do I differentiate between that and necrotizing fasciitis is I'd see at how symptomatic the patient is compared to the limb. If it's more so than the signs, then I know something's going on. And if I feel crepitus at any point in time, 
I'd, I'd consider the worst and refer the patient if I'm in a peripheral center or get the surgeon involved at the earliest because I want to know what's happening and if the patient requires surgery promptly. You know, I don't delay or send the patient back home based on a superficial examination. So I wanted to cover these points. The rest of them is quite fairly covered. What about imaging? Do you do you think anything related to imaging? Oh, in no. help, or it's just clinical and more scenarios. So cellulitis and necrotizing facetis is more or less clinical, but in uh, you know the Western countries, what they do is they actually do an MRI for necrotizing facetis to delineate how far off it is, how deep it is, and then plan out the surgery and whatnot. In our Indian setup, MRIs are not always available. It take takes time and it's costly. Okay, a simple USG can be done in cellulitis patients to rule out any you know abscess collections as such, because most of the times when you have equivocal cases, it's not in compartment, but it's kind of you know it, it feels off on clinical examination comes with experience. Then you can go ahead with the simple scan, but I usually don't do the scan. You can wait a good forty eight hours for cellulitis for it to localize where the infection started. Okay, within forty eight hours that gets done, or if the symptoms are still persisting, then you can go ahead with the fasciotomy. But getting a scan in preemptively won't really help because it's already edema in the subcutaneous tissue. So, you know, a radiologist can always write up suboptimal study and be done with it. But you're the one stuck with the patient. So, cellulitis patients, wait for 48 hours. If you still have a good degree of suspicion, go ahead with a simple soft tissue scan. You should be fine. Necrotizing face it is Western countries, they kind of get an MRI done. But in our cities, in our setup, sorry, we don't usually do that. Necrotizing facetis is quite overt. It's quite obvious. And, uh, you know, they say necrotizing facetis always smells sweet. Or uh, they have this sweetly odor. So it smells sweet, but it's bad. So with experience, you'll figure it out. Uh, that way, I'd say imaging for cellulitis, yes, after 48 hours. For necrotizing facetis, never. Just go ahead with surgery and save the patient. Well, back to you, Nathaniel. Okay. Oh shit. Hi. Hello. We can hear you, Nathaniel. Hi. Hello. Nathaniel, can you? Oh, you can hear me. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. going on. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. I don't know what happened in my net. Yes, we yeah. can hear you. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. So coming to uh, the next thing is an abscess, like how to do an IND. I think this is what everyone is excited about doing minor surgical procedures. So uh, going to the next slide, please. So this is what a basic step. So when you when you locate an, an abscess, uh, most of the time it's a clinical diagnosis. You can see the amount of collection if you have a superficial abscess, like a carbuncle or something like that. Always important to give initially local anesthesia. Uh, if you feel if it's not near the digits or it's not in the penile area where, where you have just uh, a single vascular supply, avoid adrenaline with your with your local anesthetist. Um, incision is cruciate. What you see here, so the so this is what the, the if you go from A to B, there's local anesthesia. Then at C, he's making an incision, which is a cruciate incision. And at D, if you can see, he's using a sinus forceps to like open up the cavity and drain it. Once it's drained, a thorough wash, and then later she just packed the cavity and closed it. I will show you a, a, a video later on for uh, because this is very, very like practical. I can't really um, explain to you how it's done on a, on a slide, but I'll try to see if I can get a video. There is a video for a sebaceous succession and an IND later on. Um, Next slide, please. Things to remember, it's uh, not a linear incision. Sorry, that was a mistake. It's cruciate incision. Uh, use the level number size blade. Uh, make sure you squeeze well, take a, uh, remove uh, adequate amount of the pus. Uh, make sure you take cultures, very important because your antibiotic cover will be based on your culture. Give a wood wash with H2O2 and betadine. Keep the cavity open and achieve hemostasis. So if there's any bleeding, make sure you uh, get either with a bite or like a hemostatic suture, or you can sometimes even using H2O and betadine can cause some amount of hemostasis. 
pack the wound really well because that will also help in hemostasis in one way as well as and make sure you keep the wick out so that there is some amount of drainage and review the wound after 24 hours when it's settled and give like you'll need regular dressings for about a week or so till it starts healing. Next. So uh, this is for diabetic foot infections. It's just a classification by the Infectious Disease Society and the work, International Working Group on Diabetic Foot. So when you have no systemic or local infection, that is class one, basically no infection. Class two is when there's a local skin subcutaneous infection, just a mild infection, there's no systemic involvement. In the class three, that is a moderate diabetic foot, you will have features of osteomyelitis, involvement of deeper fascia, abscess formation. And the last is a severe form, which is local with uh, symptoms of SIRS, which is basically a severe systemic infection. In these cases, they probably refer because they might even need ICU care and pressors and all of that. Go next. So important in diabetic foot is to assess the wound and suggest, uh, so see signs of inflammation, pass, look at the neurological and vascular status of the foot. It is not, many a times you may not have an ultrasound to do a Doppler, but just looking at the pulse, looking at, uh, comparing the pulse of the right and the left foot, looking at all the pulses, uh, feeling, doing a neurological examination, because this you are, when you're doing, and you're working as a primary doctor in a rural area, it's not just you're doing, seeing only surgical cases, you're looking at the complete um, picture of the patient. So it's very important that you look at the neurological status, do an examination, check if he's having any uh, cracks in his foot because he may not be feeling look at any look at his foot and see if there if if there is sensations are intact or if he's not able to see if he's having diabetic neuropathy assess the glycemic control and then also assess if there's any need for debridement if there's like a bad looking wound with slough you can do a bedside debridement i'm sure all of you all have in in John's as interns assisted your PGs to do debridements of skin, of uh, wounds in the wards. So that do investigations involved would be X-ray to look for features of OM, look for periosteal reaction, uh, take a swab always to look for culture sensitivity. Of course, start empirical treatment like your Coamox and Cefazolin, but make sure you do get a swab culture because these patients will end up having a prolonged infection, non-healing wound, and the whole cycle keeps going because vascular insufficiency, immunocompromise, poor healing wound, worsening infection, becoming resistant, and it just the whole cycle goes on. So important to get a swab early so you can target the particular organism. Next. Okay, this is a very complex uh, uh, slide. There's a lot of information, but just to briefly tell you, look at it whether severe or mild moderate, that's the classification that you use. If it's a severe infection, you have to admit the patient needs IV antibiotics, take blood and uh, cultures from the wound and treat it with antibiotics. If there's need for debridement, do it. Look at it, review the patient after 48 hours. If he's improving, you can slowly switch from an IV to a to a oral antibiotic and then discharge the patient based on Again, look at these x-rays. You need to see if the if it's there's osteomyelitis, then you need to discharge the patient on a very long antibiotic plan. Second thing, if it's not improving, getting worse, there's more signs of systemic infection. That's I'm, I'm not right now looking at the right side of the flow chart. So if there's a lot of worsening infection, and even after the IV antibiotics for about 48 hours, he's not improving sepsis, then refer these patients because these patients will are on a downward spiral. If it's a mild and moderate infection, you can do x-rays, do all of this, uh, do the basic investigations. If it's improving, go on antibiotics. And if it's not improving, then again, hospitalize the patient, take the immune on IV antibiotics. Next slide, please. Uh, this is again the antibiotic cover. If it's polymicrobial, it again involves piptaz and im imipenem and clindamycin. But if you're going for just a, a diabetic foot infection, which is not polymicrobial at this point, uh, early just GPCs and MRSA, then you can treat it with uh, amoxicillin. But if it's MRSA, you need to go with linezolid. This is important, the duration of antibiotics. If there's soft tissue infection up to three weeks, if it's infected bone up to six weeks, if there's no residual infection, so patient has a raised amputation or a proper debridement, there's no infective tissue, just five to seven days of antibiotics is enough. Next slide. Yeah. Uh, anything else on diabetic foot? Yeah, just um, one point to note. 
uh, if the x-ray is showing signs of osteomyelitis, it's highly likely you might end up in an amputation as your primary surgery. Because uh, more often than not, it acts as a source of, uh, you know, keep reinfecting that area, healing is poor, diabetic control goes out of, you know, haywire, uh, repeated sepsis episodes. So uh, usually uh, we go for amputations and diabetic patients with x-ray showing features of osteomyelitis. And uh, features of osteomyelitis on x-ray, please go through it. It's, uh, you know, you'll have to again get an x-ray done after a gap of three to four weeks and things like that. Always keep reevaluating the patient as a fresh patient again and again. Because uh, we've had patients from uh, primary centers come here with an x-ray being completely fine, which was done a month or two ago. And uh, next x-ray showing features of periosteal clouding and everything, osteomyelitic changes. So that's one point I think uh, I'd like to add other than whatever was covered. Yeah. Okay. Okay, okay. back to the time. Yeah. So this is yeah that that's any other questions anyone diabetic or oh, they're going to take questions later okay so case six is a 28 year old female who came with swelling over the back since one month associated with some minimal redness around the swelling no other comorbidities on examination this is what that looks like does anyone want to give a guess of what it is come on guys please don't sleep i know i'm very boring <laughs> I know it's getting yes. Oh, someone... Very good. Thank you very much. Do you think it's an infected sebaceous cyst, or do you think it's like just a normal sebaceous cyst? Maybe infected. Yeah. So there's minimal redness. There is some pain that she's having. So yeah, probably an infected sebaceous cyst. Uh, can you take the slide, please? So yeah. So this is a brief overview of how you would probably do an excision. I have a slide, I have a video later on that you can probably see. So this, it, this an observation says generally has a punctum and um, you need to basically, to for excision of sebaceous cyst, it's very important for you to uh, inject. Uh, so you need to first create uh, create an elliptical incision. So obviously a local anesthetist, if, you, if it's on the back in this case, you can give adrenaline there's no issue with that. You can give local anesthetics with adrenaline. And uh, then you need to uh, do what you call an elliptical incision like this, in this case. And then you need to dissect around the, the cyst wall. Make sure you do not break the cyst wall. And once you're out with the cyst, give a thorough wash and then suture. Go next. Next slide, please. Yeah, so these are things to remember. Elliptical in incision, avoid puncturing the cyst while making the incision. Make sure you get the entire of cyst out because if you don't do that, the patient will get a recurrent sebaceous cyst and then she's going to come back to you and say, you know, doctor, what did you do? So uh, make sure you do that. Um, and whenever you're closing, if you're not able to close the wound because of some amount of tension, like in the back or so, you can just leave it open and heal and secondary healing and then maybe do a delayed suturing. But if you are able to close it, there's nothing like it. You can go ahead and do, but it should be a tension-free closure of the wound. Because if there's tension on the wound, then again, it will affect the healing. Next slide, please. Yeah, that's about it in sebaceous cyst. Okay, I'll show the video later, I think, the, the one from Jomi. I have that video. Yeah, so suturing wounds... Yeah, anything, sir? I just like to add, uh, yeah. So uh, I just like to add one thing on suppose the sebaceous cyst was infected, right? And you go ahead, obviously, an IND, you get all the pus out. But one extra thing that one extra step that would that you would take for an infected sebaceous cyst is you do something called as an avulsion of sac. Okay. So despite it being IND and everything, you try to remove as much of the sac as you can. So suppose it's a non infected one planes are preserved and you go ahead and it comes out beautifully, you know, you're parting, you have the entire sebaceous cyst with you. But if it's an abscess, planes are not maintained and you can't keep cutting a larger part of the tissue just to make sure you get everything out. So do an IND, get the pus out, give a thorough wash, you'll always be able to identify the cyst or if you're doing it for the first, the cyst wall, sorry, or if you're doing it for the first time, have someone around you who's done it before, just simply pick up whatever, you know, part of the sebaceous cyst sac wall that you can see, avulse it. Keep taking it out in bits and pieces, 
fragmentation is also okay but make sure you take care of it because next time the pa- patient comes with you it comes with uh, she come with a granulating healing wound and you'll have to just do secondary suturing and close it so most of the times you know she might go to another doctor who will do it and there parts of the cyst wall still embedded inside and that becomes a site of recurrence so this is one thing even if it's infected you will still have to remove the cyst wall out so basic principle is cyst wall out cyst wall out cyst wall out yeah okay i'll give it back to nathan yeah next slide oh. yeah so last part of the topic is suturing of wounds so there are three principles mainly make sure there's a proper distribution of tension there is a traumatic handling of tissues there's too much of if there's a lot of trauma you keep on um, you know handling the tissues really uh, badly with your forceps or with your needle there's obviously risk of more infection make sure you avert the wound margins when you're suturing line up the skin edges precisely to ensure that there's minimal scarring do not pull too hard and reduce the tension wherever possible because that will cause wound breakdown go next next please Yeah, so these are the types of sutures. You've got absorbable and non-absorbable sutures. In absorbable, you've got synthetic, which is monocryl, vicryl. Vicryl is what you definitely most of the time use when you're doing like closing inner planes, subcutaneous tissue. Uh, PDS is what they use in in to close your um, uh, rect uh, your rectus sheet and your uh, in in abdominal surgeries. It's again absorbable. when you mean uh, absorbable it generally uh, uh, so and uh, yeah so non absorbable as your ethylon which is generally used for your skin proline is again used when you want to do like a mesh repair or something like that where you need to fix the mesh you use they use proline and um, the other natural forms are surgical cotton and silk which is again used for uh, when you want like when you when i say non absorbable doesn't mean that it stays for a very long time it just means that it gets absorbed probably over a longer period of time next slide please yeah so this this is just a brief informative thing about what is absorbable non absorbable and multifilament monofilament monofilament generally uh yeah that that just this is just an informative slide go next is not much to do so these are just simple suturing techniques uh, it's very difficult for me to actually explain this on a slide but like this is the these are pictures i got from medscape so simple sutures can is the easiest form whenever you want to close any wound uh, say mostly uh, you can just you know you, you just need to quickly achieve hemostasis you just want to close a wound which is actively bleeding and you don't know just go with a uh, simple sutures for like small wounds Uh, make sure that you do not uh, if it's like a wound that requires a lot of tension simple sutures are not the best you go f- you prefer going for a mattress suture next slide please so this is what uh, sim- it's the easiest quickest way to do a simple closure um, under and achieve hemostasis in certain bleeding wounds if you've got patients like you know sometimes you get these cuts and all of that someone's like accidental injuries and cuts you can always go with a simple suture though if you want him next slide please so this is what interlocking so then you when you cover, like when you're closing deeper fascia particularly like when you do lscs and all of that i think you would have been in in johns when you assisted they they generally close uh with an interlocking uh, suture uh go next there's really not much i can talk about in this yeah but closure of the wound under tension if you need to like you know when the skin is mobile and you need to close wounds under uh, and for hemostasis vertical mattress is a very good uh, choice for closure of wound that is mobile and you want good aversion of margins next slide horizontal mattress can be used a lot when you're having like uh, basically what we call a box suture when you basically have like a bleeding um uh, in like probably a subcutaneous vessel or something that's bleeding and you want to tie it you can do something called a figure of 8 or you do a horizontal mattress and tie off the bleeder in that case next slide these are a few other uh, different uh, types of sutures um suturing techniques can you go next Yeah, so subcutaneous suture is very uh, good when you have like when you don't want when you want minimal scarring, like probably on the face or even you can even use simple sutures on the face. 
but uh, subcutaneous is has minimal scarring and you don't use it in wounds which have high tension because then there's always risk of gaping next slide yeah so yes. important thing about is more tension in the uh, wound then you need more time to keep the sutures in when there's obviously a risk of when you keep more the sutures in for more time there's more scarring and there's more risk of infection and tissue reaction um so this is very important on the face it takes about five to seven days for healing on the neck about seven days to keep in sutures scalp you can go up to 10 days in the upper extremities and the trunk you keep sutures for about 14 days and lower extremities about a little more than 14 days i mean this is what i have got from uh medscape i'm not sure whether it's still the same or it's different Doctor said, what would you say about this? So uh, what we follow is face uh, by the fourth, fifth day, it's out because it heals very fast. Neck again by the fifth day, it's out. Uh, neck, we usually go for subcuticular rather. So it's no need to take it out. It's absorbable. Uh, scalp, uh, we keep it for a little longer because, you know, um, the way of suturing the scalp trauma is interlocking continuous. Otherwise, it's vertical mattress. Keep it for six days, remove alternate and then remove the rest by nine, ten days. So it's not like we remove all at one shot, right? We remove alternate. We see how the wound appears, if it's gaping, if it's giving away, and then take a call regarding remove the rest. Upper limb, uh, trunk, I would say, yeah, 10 days, definitely. After the 10 or 12 day, we decide on taking alternate. With the 14 day, the rest of them are out. Uh, extremities, we keep it 10 days. Uh, 14 to 21 days seems, uh, 21 days is usually for these uh, abdominal uh, tension suturings. So we keep them for uh, 21 days and then, yeah, for then we take care of uh, 10 days would be my go-to period where you can revalidate the wound for upper and lower extremities and then plan either alternate or, you know, remove all of them in a shot. Alternate would be better and then you can remove the rest later on. Rest so of the time, uh, please. Uh, no, no, continue, continue. Sorry. Yeah, so, I don't know, sure. Uh, so basically it's, uh, wherever, you know, nowadays what we're doing is we're doing multi-layer suturing where the top motion is always subcuticular. So the patient doesn't have to run around for, you know, suture removal and whatnot. Only in like really trauma situations or laparotomies, we keep these sutures for a long time. So nowadays it's more of subcuticular, absorbable, which, you know, patient doesn't need to come to hospital anymore other than just getting a biopsy report. So yeah, yeah, go ahead, Nathan. No, I just wanted to ask you with respect to types of suturing techniques in wound closures, like how, how would how you go about that? Because... Like different people have different, I don't know. It's like some people say mattress, some people say, you know, simple sutures, subcuticular. Closing in multiple layers, they say there's more, if you put in more sutures, you have more risk of it. More foreign material. Yeah, yeah, more foreign material. So that, that's been a very, yeah. like, I've not got really a lot of information in terms of that, I mean, on the net or anywhere online. So I just want to know if you could talk about that. Yeah, sure. So basically one is, it's a trauma or is it, you know, uh, incised wound under controlled atmospheres. If it's trauma related, it's always jagged, beveled edges and whatnot. You're dealing with a lot of other issues. Plastics, you know, in the on the face, they do it on four layers, five layers because they want scarless outcomes. But for us in the abdomen and whatnot, we go for two layers. If the muscle is exposed, three layers. How would we, how we would approach it is... Uh, we would take far off sutures, right? Because we want to assess what's happening underneath. If it's going to be infected, might as well allow far off suturing so that it, it has a way of coming out. So we take spaced suturing, intermittent for muscle, continuous for fascia because it has no blood supply. It needs no blood supply. Then subcutaneous again, intermittent. And skin, they are too, like, you know, some of the professors in our department, they leave the skin open. They don't close it. They just do subcuticular closure and leave it open. Because they feel that healing by secondary intention allows there to be less risk of exercise. Uh, mm. Another professor in the department, he puts intermittent skin sutures, which are really spaced. So that this is a place, you know, for uh, collections, lipolysis and other pus and everything to come out. And you have a place where you can keep draining it. Others go ahead with the complete sutures and then they evaluate and then remove one or two sutures for uh, allowing drainage. So it depends basically on your experience. I personally feel spaced intermittent skin closures is the way to go because you're approximating the skin. At the same time, you're allowing space to be there between each suture so that you can give a wash or you can allow whatever collections are there to come out. So you're not really allowing there to be a collection within a subcutaneous plane which gets anaerobically infected and then starts spreading around. And the other thing is, 
with regards to the face it becomes a bit more complicated because you can't have scarring outcomes so plastics what they do is they take the patient off for debridement they refashion the wound in a way in which it appears as though it is inside in a it is incised in a controlled atmosphere like they appear as though they close in a, a linear fashion that is there's no ragged edges they refashion the skin and everything and they do multi layer closure for them uh, they take the risk of doing it because they want again a very good cosmetic outcome so in my opinion it is intermittent spaced so just because at least you are approximating something and you have space to get out all the dirt and collections and whatever that's happening so again it's experience basis the european honey society tells intermittent and then facial closure is always continuous muscle intermittent so things like that so uh, for 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 a peripheral setting i think as long as you can do intermittent surgery should be fine vertical mattress if you feel there's a lot of tissue loss and what not again but keep it spaced always allow there to be space for something inside to come out like you know how they say abscess always finds its way out so give it a way out rather than allowing it to spread somewhere deeper and causing more issues for you i would no. that would be my take home point here yeah, for this cool next slide so these are just a few wounds so this is what a venous um, ulcer would look like uh, basically a very superficial ulcer with like clean edges not punched out it's and mostly in the gaiters area so these are just few wounds that you can identify so this you would put like a normal bandage you can treat it with a compression uh bandage because you want to uh, reduce the venous pooling so that you have better healing of the wound next slide this is what an arterial wound would look like and because of vascular uh, insufficiency you have punched out ulcers deeper ulcers and again a foot with dry gangrene these patients will need doppler and further evaluation for the same next slide okay this is what a uh, trophic ulcer basically what we call a pressure sore would look like so you see first initially there's like a good amount of uh, there's a lot of infection in the extreme corner then that patient has been debrided and all of that and it looks better now and and then eventually finally you see that pressure sore slowly healing so this is so this is just for you to know what looks like a very bad dirty and disgusting wound versus what looks like a more clean and um uh, uh healing wound so this gives you an idea you know that you're going on the right path when you're treating a patient with these with your dressings so that you don't because sometimes a lot of you all have this doubt is what type of uh, uh like what what wound is the wound healing not healing am i doing the right thing because wound healing takes time provided you should know that these take almost like about 2 3 weeks to get to the last picture so don't be disheartened when you have keep seeing these wounds because they keep walking and it keeps getting worse so this is just to show you what is a good wound versus what is a non healing and a bad wound next yeah so the summary at last is to say that clinical assessment is crucial in diagnosing any acute surgical abdomen don't just go by investigations because sometimes you don't have a lot of investigation so make sure clinically you are very good with your abdominal examination you can pick up things fluid resuscitation is very important and bowel decompression is very important in any acute abdomen when you are very unsure about any acute abdomen fluid resuscitate the patient make him fit so in case he needs surgery he is actually fit to go in for surgery and second thing is decompress the bowel you, you it's always good to play safe when you decompress the bowel and and provide rest to the bowel refer immediately if you don't have surgical uh, facilities but may as uh, i, I after doing the initial reha, uh, initial resuscitation and the bowel decompression and giving the first dose of an appropriate antibiotic these three things you do and you refer the patient i think you've done a very good job with dealing with acute abdomen investigation is always non conclusive sometimes when you're treating patients with uh, probably because you don't some of them don't have cts which are like better forms of investigations for these patients so you don't have those sometimes x rays may not be very well at picking up bowel obstruction or perforation sometimes you may not see it and many times in emergency in johns also we have not seen them so don't look at it clinically and always play safe if you feel that you cannot deal with it just refer the patient next next slide 
Yeah, identifying an unhealthy wound and treat accordingly. Always look at severity of the diabetic food infection and treat the antibiotic according to the severity. Identify if there's early surgical need for surgical invent, intervention or if there's any need for any surgical debridement or whatever in terms of necrotizing fascia. Identify a sebaceous cyst if possible and exercise under supervision. If you don't have someone who's done it before, I would suggest, you know, you just uh, probably refer the patient or get someone who's done it so that you can you can do it under his supervision first. Knowing the types of sutures and understanding the various suture techniques. So I've covered most of this in this. That, that's, that's about it in today's class. Yeah, next slide. Yeah, thank you. I think it was too long. <laughs> Everyone's just <laughs> gone. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I know... Thanks for the session, uh, Nathaniel, Dr. Nathaniel, and Dr. Syed. Uh, it is very difficult to have yeah. a short session for surgery because it's a very vast topic. You, it's very difficult to keep it under 20 minutes. But then I'm sure everybody have, has a good idea of how to go ahead and uh, manage these conditions when they don't feel like it's the first time they're encountering it. Um, and that is what we expect uh, as an outcome from this session, and I'm sure they also have the same feelings. And I also thank everybody who attended this session. And it was uh, uh, thanks for all the support you give us. So the rest of the, uh, I have put a feedback form on the chat and also on the group, the discussion group. I've already added Nathaniel to the group. I'll uh, get Dr. Syed also added to the group. So if you have any doubts there, you can always ask those doubts and get it cleared. And anytime you come across anything surgical and you don't, you're not very sure, you can always put it up in the group and we can have a discussion there. Always feel free to do that. Anyone has anyone has questions that they want us to talk? Yeah, because that's the other thing. The, best time. Initially, the plan was to give a break and I'm guessing it's a little too late at the moment. So what you can do is you can start oh, okay. the discussion session, any questions you have. I don't see any questions in the chat at the moment. Let me have a look at the discussion group. If anybody has put up any questions. I know it got a little too long, actually. Yeah. So it's just a lot to cover. It's, a, it's just a lot to cover in, 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 yeah. in the time that's given. And it's just, it's the whole of surgery. Like the other topics you have, like, uh, you get like diabetes, what person, hypertension. It's just like the whole of surgery that you want to cover. It. Yeah. It I, actually I, covered quite a bit, to be honest. Yes. Uh, covered all of it, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, as as somebody who has done the rural bond, I don't, uh, I haven't seen many more surgical cases that we have come across. So I, I, I believe that this gives a very good uh, base baseline information for going ahead with and treating patients, uh, which is a very, I, I, it's a very comprehensive one. And I also learned a lot from it uh, because we do see many surgical cases here too. And then it helps us on knowing what to, when to refer and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Any questions That's on the people fun. who are left in this chat? <laughs> there's, I think there's Dwani and Akshay and Anusha. Okay. There's just like three, four people. Anyone wants to ask something? It's a very small group. You can ask whatever you feel. Any doubts? Quickly before we just close. No? Okay, fine. I think they just don't want to talk. Fine, like no issues, yeah. No worries. So you can always uh, contact in the group, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, you we've got a John and Academic group and we've got other groups. You can always call a uh, message any one of us or so, and we can always like help you out. There are a lot of surgeons who are willing to help if you have. You can probably add Sir to the group, and if there's anything they want to discuss, we can discuss on the group as well. Yeah, yeah that's about it. We, we do have a group uh, for discussions for this bootcamp session. So people who have already joined before in the session, so they we will add you to the group, and they should be able to ask you more questions and uh, their queries. Yeah. Hey, enough, thanks, yeah. Nathaniel. Thanks and a lot. Uh, thanks, it's a really good session. Thanks, and sir. Thank you, sir. Hey, thank you, Nathaniel. Thank you for inviting yeah. me to do this. Yeah, yeah. And good night, everybody. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Yeah. Dr. Daniel. Yeah. Good night. Good night, guys. Thanks, good night Daniel. On night. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll uh, uh -huh. keep it calling then. Yeah, bye-bye then. Yeah. Bye, guys. Bye.